Well, hello, everybody. And today we want to look at the somatosensory system. What we want to do is we want to apply the four questions that we considered when thinking about sensory systems and see how they work within the context of the somatosensory system. So let's just give a brief definition of the somatosensory system. Somato means body. And so the somatic senses refer to the perception of touch, temperature, proprioception, and pain. All of this information comes from receptors that are found within the skin, the joints, the muscles, and the viscera of the body. We will be focusing today primarily on touch and temperature. So the first question, of course, is what is it? And you remember that what is it is dependent upon the type of sensory receptor. And so we want to spend a little time thinking about what are the sensory receptors that are active within the somatosensory system. Well, essentially, within the somatosensory system, our sensory receptors are modified epithelial cells that are found within the skin. And when we look at this, we find that there are two submodalities for touch. There's fine or discriminatory touch. And then there's also crude touch. Crude touch will describe sensations such as itching and tickle. These sensations are vague and they're difficult to localize. Fine touch is very discreet and it gives you high spatial resolution, allowing you to tell exactly where on the body is being touched. Now, there are four types of receptors in the skin that I just want us to briefly look at. These four receptors are the Pustinian corpuscle, Mycenaeus corpuscle, Ruffini's corpuscle, and Merkel's disc. Let's look at the Pustinian first, which is a classic example of a sensory receptor within the skin. So you can see both a drawing of a Pustinian corpuscle. But you can also see a cross section using uh, a microscope, what the Persinian corpuscle actually looks like. And the Persinian corpuscle has a modified nerve ending in which the nerve ending is surrounded by a series of lamellae. It consists of a group two myelinated fiber and its total size is actually very large, almost a millimeter in diameter. When the capsule, which as we said is very large, is deformed due to pressure, that results in a change in membrane potential. The result is sodium is able to enter the membrane of the nerve, leading to a generator potential. And if large enough, you get an action potential being fired in the group two myelinated nerve. Now, one of the unique features about the Pacinian corpuscle is this is a very rapidly adapting receptor. And that ability to adapt rapidly is actually a property of the fluid filled lamellae that surround the ends of the nerves. This diagram demonstrates that. If we look in the top figure, we can see that when a stimulus is applied to the Pacinian corpuscle, you get a response. But even though the stimulus is present, adaptation takes place very quickly and the response disappears. However, when we remove the stimulus, uh, the same thing happens. We get a response that disappears very quickly. In experiments that have been done in which the lamellae have been removed, what we discover is it turns the Pacinian corpuscle from a fast adaptive receptor to a slowly adaptive receptor. And so this tells us that the presence of the lamellae, something about them enables the receptor to be fast adaptive. And it has been hypothesized that the fluid presence in the lamellae is the thing that leads to the fast adaptation. When uh, initial deformation takes place, this fluid is uh, displaced and that pressure is transmitted to the nerve, leading to a change in membrane conductance. But that fluid quickly uh, flows back in and 
restores the normal resting membrane potential and leads to no longer a generation enhancement potential. So this fast adapting property of these Pacinian corpuscles means that they are ideally suited to detecting vibration. And you can see here in this diagram what we mean. Again, when the stimulus is applied, you get a response immediately, and then adaptation, no response. When the stimulus is removed, same thing. And so a vibration that's constantly going on and off is ideally detected by Pacinian corpuscles. And that's exactly what this type of receptor is doing within the skin, detecting vibratory information. The other thing we just want to note about Pacinian corpuscles is because they're so large, they have very large receptive fields. But the disadvantage of large receptive fields is it means that there's poor spatial localization. So they aren't able to point and, and, and pin, uh, pinpoint things to an exact spot in the skin because of these large receptive fields. Well, this is the mycinous corpuscle. This too is a group two myelinated fiber, and this too is inserted into a capsule. The difference here is the capsule in mycinous is much, much smaller than what you find in the proscenium corpuscle. The end result is mycinous have very small receptive fields. And that means that they're very useful for detecting fine touch and are very important for something called two-point discrimination. They can be used to distinguish between two points being applied to the skin. And so you find mycinous corpuscles because of these features are found in high concentrations of the body where you want high levels of two-point discrimination. For example, the fingertips and the lips. Mycinous corpuscles are also rapidly adapting, like the persinium. And so therefore, they can also include vibratory information as occurs in tapping flutter. Well, what do we have here? This is a Merkel's disc. This is an unencapsulated mechanical receptor that's found on non-hairy skin, like the palms of the hand. At the end of the nerve, it forms a specialized epithelial cell, which is called the Merkel cell. And these have small receptive fields that are slowly adapting. And therefore, we remember that slowly adaptive receptors are important for telling us about the duration of the stimulus. Because they're small discs uh, and the nature of the disc uh, structure, receptor potentials are only generated if pressure is applied directly to the disc itself. So again, these receptors are very, very useful for localizing stimuli because they have a small receptive field. And then finally, we have the Ruffini corpuscle. Uh, these are nerve endings that find themselves in a small, bulbous, liquid field collagen capsule. And a deformation of the skin would then lead to a deformation of these capsules, which depolarizes the cell. These cells have large receptive fields and are slowly. Uh, and, and they're very useful for telling us about the magnitude of stimulus. Now, there are other couple types of receptors in the skin, like the Faust bulbs. Uh, and of course, there are pain receptors, and you can read about these in your textbook. So, this diagram just allows you to compare and contrast the different features of the four uh, receptors that we spoke about. We can see that our rapidly adaptive receptors are mycinous and persinium, but we can also see that the receptors that have small uh, receptive fields are the mycinous and the Merkel. The receptive field is a region around the central receptor shown in gray here. These are small, these are much larger. The other type of receptor that you find within the skin are our thermoreceptors. Now, thermoreceptors are free nerve endings, either of the A delta fibers or the unmyelinated C fibers. And what research has found is that you have two populations. You have fibers that 
uh, detect cold and it also have fibers that detect hot. And they operate over a different range of temperature. The pole receptors tend to be maximally active around 25 degrees, whereas the warm receptors tend to be maximally active around 45 degrees. When your hand is placed in particular temperature, like a bucket of water, uh, you activate both cold fibers and warm fibers. And it's a combination of the information coming from these fibers that the brain will use to process exactly what the perceived temperature is. And so you can think about it that if you're in a temperature of about 34 degrees, a uh, few of your, your, your warm fibers will be firing and your cold fibers will also be firing. That pattern of firing allows the brain to perceive a temperature of 30 degrees. Below about 30 degrees, you only have cold firing. And above about 37, 38, you only have a warm. Now, very hot temperatures greater than 45, and very cold temperatures greater, less, sorry, less than 5, they get picked up by a special class of thermal receptors that are called thermal nociceptors. These detect temperature, but they cause the perception to be one of pain. Obviously, that's a warning for the body if you find yourself very hot conditions, very cold. Thermal receptors are extremely rapidly adapted. So you can imagine jumping into a cold shower. Well, those first few seconds, uh, they, they can be quite um, alarming. Uh, you might want to jump out. But if you survive the first few seconds, you know very well that pretty, pretty soon you adapt. You adapt. And the same is true for uh, warmer temperatures. The other thing to note is that temperature, because it's so rapidly adapting, provides a background, background in change of intensity, like what we spoke about with the just noticeable difference. So if you put your hand in a bucket of cold water, then you transfer it into a bucket of lukewarm water, that lukewarm water will feel a lot warmer than it is. This is a result of that just noticeable different principle that we were talking about. Okay, let's move on to our next uh, question. Where is it? Well, one of the primary functions of the somatosensory system is to tell the brain what part of the body is stimulated. And you can imagine that if you don't know what part of your body is being stimulated, you can have a lot of fun. Here we have a situation uh, that's showing a foot ulcer in somebody who has diabetes. Because of peripheral neuropathy, the result is their nerves on their feet are no longer working. And so if they get a little cut on the foot, they don't feel that pain, and they don't take care, take care of the cut. And the end result is an ulcer can develop, and they might not even be aware of it. And this can be infected become gangrenous, and it's often what happens in diabetes when persons have an amputation. As we discussed before, we answer where is it according to the label line code. Label line code. Now this gives us a pattern on the body, which we call the dermatome, as you can see in this diagram here. Now the dermatome refers to the body area innervated by the neurons for a single spinal nerve. So there are several spinal nerves that emerge from the spinal cord, go to different parts of the body. Each spinal nerve then becomes responsible for innervating a different portion of the skin. And if you understand where each spinal nerve goes, you get a sense of the, the distribution across the entire body. So you can just see that uh, nerve T4 is generally associated with the area around the nipple. Nerve T10 is generally associated with the area around the umbilicus. Nerve S1 is generally associated with the inner part of the, the leg and the big toe. So if you're doing sensory testing in the body, and you find out that there's a lot of sensation here on the big toe area, you can say, well, uh, probably something's going wrong 
sorry, not S1, not S1. S1 is for the small toe. L5 is for the big toe. So if you're doing sensory testing and you find a problem with the big toe, you could say there's probably something going on with your L5 nerve. This idea of dermatomes uh, is highlighted by an unusual condition uh, known as shingles. Now, many of us might have had uh, the disease chickenpox, or maybe you had a vaccination and you never took, you never got the disease. But for those of us who have chickenpox, it's caused by a virus called herpes zoster. And as your body fights that infection, sometimes the virus goes and it hides within the nerve cells of a particular dermatome uh, within the dorsal root ganglia. Later on, if the person becomes stressed or their immune system weakens, these viruses have the ability to emerge to cause a reinfection. But here you don't get chickenpox. You get a series of blisters upon the skin. But they have a unique distribution associated with the dermatome distribution. Because it, for some reason, the virus goes and hides in very specific localized nerves around one or two dermatomes. And so for those who have shing shingles, sorry, um, chicken box, unfortunately, this is something that will happen to you in the future. Now, in thinking about where is it, we also want to talk about something called two-point discrimination. Two-point discrimination is the minimal distance in which you can pursue, perceive stimuli as two separate events. Now, if you look at this diagram here, what do we see? Well, this is a sensory neuron, and this is the receptive field of that sensory neuron. If you apply two separate points within that receptive field, because anything within this field is detected by this nerve, the nerve will only consider that as one point. This is not two-point discrimination. Two-point discrimination is not going here. The brain is perceiving this as one. However, if you have a situation where the two receptive fields overlap, when you apply the two separate points, the brain detects that and therefore perceives this as two separate points. As we just saw, depending on the type of receptors that you have, within the skin and their receptive fields, you'll either have very good two-point discrimination or limited two-point discrimination. And this is something that you can do at home. And you can see just looking at this diagram here, that there are certain parts of the body, like the back of the calf and the thigh, where you can actually have five centimeters difference between two points. And the person won't realize it's two points. But then the face and the hands, you can have much smaller distribution, just a few millimeters, and the person is able to tell you that they're perceiving two points. Now, this ability to distinguish between two separate uh, points uh, is helped by something called lateral inhibition. Now, you'll study this in a lot more detail when you do the eye, because this is very well demonstrated within the eye. But in lateral inhibition, a stimulus, while activating the neurons directly in its pathway, sends inhibitory into neurons to the neurons next to it to shut them down and inhibit them. And what that does is that sharpens the perception and creates contrast. So let's look at that in work in this particular diagram. Here, a pin is applied or pressure is applied at a point. And the, 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 the pathway that gets the most stimulus is neuron B. So the most excitation occurs through neuron B. As a result, neuron B not only sends a signal to the brain, but it also sends inhibitory into neurons to the pathways next to it shutting them down. The end result is what would have started off as a graded signal. As it goes up through the nervous system, the lateral pathways get inhibited, and the signal stands out as a signal coming from B. And 
and it helps the brain to localize the area of maximum uh, impact or maximum pressure. And this is a general feature of the nervous system because the nervous system wants to detect contrast and wants to be able to extract features from things that are coming towards it. Now, this principle is found in this illusion here called the Mach bands, where as there's a change in color, that feature extraction is applied, and therefore, every time there's a change, you get a sense that there's a, a line here. I just want you to do us some homework and some research for you to read up about Mach bands and see how lateral inhibition is being used to cause this greater sense of contrast. A little bit of light here and a little bit of dark on the other side gives the illusion of a line occurring here due to lateral inhibition. Often, uh, when you're looking at x rays in, in the teeth, uh, this is something that dentists have to be careful of to ensure that if there are braces or if there are other things, that they don't create that mac band uh, distortion that get, gets perceived. At, uh, now, of course, in talking about where is it we said we have to talk about the label line code. That means we have to trace the pathway from the receptor to the brain. Now, there are two definitive pathways that are important for our sense of touch. There are actually a couple more than two, but there are two primary pathways that we want to talk about. The first one is called the dorsal column pathway. And that pathway is important for what we call fine touch, two point discrimination, and proprioception. The second one is called the anterior lateral system or the spinal thalamic pathway. And that carries information about pain, temperature, and crude touch. Now, these pathways have unique. Uh, there's a unique anatomy to them that I want you to notice. All of them start with a first order neuron that enters via the dorsal root ganglia. And you should know from your anatomy that sensory pathways enter via the dorsal root ganglia and motor pathways exit via the ventral root ganglia. So in both cases, the first order neuron goes from the sensory receptor enters the spinal cord via the dorsal root ganglia. This here is our dorsal column. This here is our spinal thalamic tract. The spinal thalamic tract, as soon as it enters, it crosses to the other side. So it synapses with the second order neuron, and the second order neuron crosses to the other side of the spinal cord, and then runs contralaterally through the spinal cord to synapse with the third order neuron in the thalamus. From there, the third order neuron goes to the cortex. This is in contrast to the dorsal column, which ascends on the ipsilateral side, and then up near the medulla synapses in the nucleus cuneatus and nucleus gracilis. And from there, the second order neuron deficits crosses over to the other side and ascends to the thalamus, where it synapses with the third order neuron. And so what we see, one pathway runs ipsilaterally, that's the dorsal column, whereas the other pathway runs quadrilaterally, that's the spinal thalamus. And so you should be able to draw a table that compares these two tracks. We've seen that they carry different types of information. We've seen that they have uh, different uh, pathways. But we also see that there are some similarities. They both uh, consist of first, second, and third order neurons. So this slide just summarizes the type of information carried by the dorsal column, and that carries by the spinal thalamic tract. And this diagram here just summarizes what we said about the dorsal column, where you can see it entering via the dorsal root ganglia, running ipsilaterally, 
dense synapsing in the nucleus gracilis and cuneatus uh, around the medulla region, the brain stem, and then crossing and running contralaterally the synapse and the synapse, thalamus, and then go on to the cortex. And this is in contrast to the anterior lateral or your spinal thalamic system, which as soon as it enters the spinal cord, it crosses to run contralaterally to the before interfacing the third order. And this diagram just summarizes what we've said by looking at it through a cross section of the spine. You would note that both pathways went to the thalamus. And in anatomy, you are going to realize the importance of the thalamus as a collection of nuclei. I just want to say here at this point that the thalamus is a relay station before the sensory cortices. And it collects all sensory information from the body except for olfaction. So all sensory information will go to the thalamus, except for your sense of smell. Okay, let's conclude by talking a little bit about cortical processing. What are the areas of the brain that process the sense of touch? Well, there are three areas that we want to talk about. The primary somatosensory cortex is found in the post-central gyrus. A in light blue, known as Brodmann's areas one, two, and three. The secondary somatosensory cortex, uh, that's found on the superior bank of the lateral fissure, right here. And then you also have your somatosensory association cortex, which is found behind the primary somatosensory cortex in Brodmann's areas five, seven. Now the primary cortex has a very unique feature. Every part of the body is mapped on the region of the primary cortex. And that's shown in this diagram here. But what you will notice is the distribution of the brain is a little bit different to the distribution of the body. A lot more of the brain tissue is given to the face and the hand. And a lot less, of it, a lot less is given to the back and the arms and the legs. More sensory information comes from the tongue, face, the hand than comes from the rest of the body and the tongue. And so this is what you look like on your brain. A little bit distorted, but it's what we actually all look like. The primary somatosensory cortex has six layers, as you know. And this creates vertical columns, each containing about 10,000 neurons. And each column has a different thing that it's doing. It's detecting the sense of um, sensation, but some are oriented to direction, and some are oriented to angle, and some are oriented to pressure. And the body takes all of that information and processes it and joins it together to make sense of it. The association processes, they are important for complex associations. So whereas the primary somatosensory cortex is just taken from a very small region of the body, the association cortices are now pulling together information from much larger areas of the body. And so if you stimulate these areas, the person might feel like an object is touching them or a knife is touching them. And they don't only integrate information from the sense of touch, but they also get information uh, from other senses and they integrate it all day. The result is you can get some very, very strange disorders if your association cortex gets damaged. I want you to look at these images here, and I just want you to do a little bit of research. This is a situation where a, a patient was asked to copy these diagrams, and this is what they drew. I want you to find out, well, what's this about? What's going on here? And this is a test where a doctor is drawing a letter on the hand of the patient and asking the patient to recognize the letter. If the patient cannot recognize the letter, I want you to find out what part of the brain is damaged. So that brings us to the end of our discussion uh, and talk about the somatosensory system. I just hope to give you an outline and some broad parameters. Please supplement this by your reading in your textbooks and also by looking at other videos and other resources that you will find the internet.
Until next time, thank you.